Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are um, in the world. Thanks for um, joining um, today's session. We'll be talking about reinforcement learning and its applications in the field of robotics. My name is Rei Zhu. I'm a product manager from the AWS Robotics and Autonomous Service team. Um, here's a brief overview of today's agenda. Um, to start the session, we will give an overview of the reinforcement learning uh, concept so that you understand what it is and how it works. Then we will talk a bit about you know, how is reinforcement learning or RIO uh, is related or relevant uh, for robotics and what are the applications in robotics. And next, uh, we will talk about a piece of key technology uh, called simulation that's really uh, important uh, for using reinforcement learning to solve robotics problems. And then finally, we will kind of walk you through an architectural example about how do you use AWS services to do reinforcement learning training for robotics. So first, we will be, um, you know, take a quick look at, you know, uh, the basic concept of reinforcement learning. Here's a pretty fine description of what reinforcement learning is. It's an area of machine learning where a software agent, in our case, for example, an agent running on the robot, that takes an action in the environment. And when it takes the action in the environment, it's trying to maximize a concept or a notion called a reward in order to achieve the desired behavior and outcome. Now, you can see there are a lot of terms in here, but don't worry about that because I will get into more details about what these things mean and we'll walk you through a very concrete example. Then you might be wondering, you know, um, why reinforcement learning? How does that compare to other machine learning techniques? There are a few advantages uh, for reinforcement learning as a machine learning technique, and you can see later on why that's so critical and relevant uh, for the field of robotics. Number one, um, reinforcement learning does not require any pre-existing data, and which means you can start from the ground up without any prior data getting accumulated. And second one, reinforcement learning is um, extremely powerful when it comes to uh, how adaptive it is to the surrounding environment and scenarios. It can handle really complex, dynamic, and varying behaviors and scenarios, which is very much relevant for robotics. And finally, it's cutting edge uh, research for reinforcement learning where now you can leverage uh, human inputs to intervene or make the training process more efficient. So we talked a little bit about the concepts about what is reinforcement learning. So here's kind of a concrete wa uh, walkthrough of it. So it starts with three things. Um, one is the agent. It's a piece of software that controls the action. And you can think of, for example, there's a robot and there runs an agent on it. The agent controls the behavior of the robot. And then there's a concept of environment, which is where the agent or the robot operates in. So for example, an environment could be a racing track, could be a uh, warehouse, it could be a home. And then there's this thing called policy. Policy is really the brain. The policy controls and makes the decisions about what action the agent or the robot should be taking. And the outcome of the reinforcement learning training process is actually a policy that is so smart and so intelligent that you can deploy along with the agent onto the physical device or robot to take appropriate actions. So the way the training happens is the environment feeds a state to the agent. So the agent kind of observes the surrounding environment and knows uh, the current state of the environment. And based on that, uh, the policy will make a decision on if this is the state of the world or the state of the environment, what action should we be taking? So then it'll tell the agent to take a particular action. And then that particular action will have consequences and impact on the environment. Then you can observe the result of that action to see, it, does that map to the desired behavior that you've predefined or it doesn't? When it does match your desired outcome or behavior, you get a positive reward. And when it doesn't, you get a negative, negative reward. So the RO training process kind of keeps trying this uh, cycle over and over again until a point where 
the policy or the agent always takes the desired action to drive the desired outcome to maximize the rewards. And it's this mechanism through trialing and error and eventually maximize the rewards uh, to get the model trained. So that's kind of the overview of the um, reinforcement learning training technique. So now you kind of get an idea about how reinforcement learning works, how we train uh, a reinforcement learning policy. Then how is that relevant uh, for robotics? As one of the key advantages of reinforcement learning is that it's highly adaptive to the surrounding environment. And when you think about robotics, robots operate in highly dynamic and ever-changing environments that's really impossible to predict what's going to happen next. And because of that, reinforcement learning provides a huge advantage to be accounting for these different scenarios and to make sure the robot function is robust enough and is able to handle all of these scenarios and ever-changing situations or scenarios. Uh, for example, in, in, in the field of robotic mechanical arms for motion planning, how do you determine uh, how the robotic arm should be moving so that it's have an optimal path to approach the object that it's desired to approach. In the field of warehouse navigation, we have these ground mobility robots operating highly dynamic warehouses where you have, you know, workers work alongside and walking around. You constantly have other vehicles and devices moving on, on the warehouse floor. How do you make sure that your program or your robot is intelligent and, and dynamic enough to be able to navigate around all of these complex environments. And the third one, object manipulation, where if you want to have a robotic manipulator to be able to manipulate or grasp objects of different sizes and different shape, how do you make sure that it's able to adapt based on the size, the shape, the texture, and the mass of the object? All of these different robotics applications is very hard to use traditional programming paradigm because of that dynamic and ever-changing situation. And that's where reinforcement learning really comes in and have the promise to solve all of these problems. And some of our customers have already started their, their journey of using reinforcement learning to solve some of the complex robotics applications in their business and companies. And here I'm just giving two examples, uh, Woodside Energy and GE Aviation, very, innate, very innovative groups. And we've been working with these um, two companies on using uh, AWS services and capabilities uh, and reinforcement learning to solve some of the complex uh, robotics challenges and problems in their business. Now we talked about robotics applications. We talked about the basic concept of reinforcement learning training process. Now I'm going to walk you through a very simple example so that you get the idea how the training really goes and what's the desired outcome of the training process. It's a very simple setup. Uh, there's a car, think of a robotic car that's driving on a track. And it's going to take two actions. And an action could be that either It'll turn left, or it'll turn right, or it'll move ahead and keep straight. Three possible actions and two steps. And the desired outcome is we want the car to be drive inside the track and not get off track. So that's kind of a very simple setup. But throughout this example, you get an idea about how the training works. So in this case, there's an agent which will be a piece of software running on the robot car that controls what the robot will be doing. And we have action space, as I mentioned. There are three possible actions. Uh, moving forward, make a left turn, or make a right turn. The environment in this case will be that particular track that the car is driving on. And the policy, which is what we are trying to train, it's the brain that controls uh, the car to take actions and to achieve the desired outcome, which is stay inside the track. And observation space is basically after an action is being taken by the car, it observes the environment and see uh, whether the robot or whether the car is inside the track or off the track. So that's the basic setup and how this setup maps to the reinforcement learning concepts we just discussed. So. 
At the very beginning, you can see two new concepts here uh, for the process reinforcement and learning training. One is something called an episode. You can really think of episode as kind of um, you know an interval of trialing and error. It could be based on time, or it could be based on certain conditions. Let's say you know if the robot is or the car is off the track, then conclude that episode, then reset. You're going back to square zero from the very original state and environment and do that again. And then there's a concept called epoch. You can think of the epoch as a group of episodes. And uh, epoch is typically mapped to a policy version because typically as you train the policy and make it smarter and smarter, you keep different versions along the way. Uh, one, you can go back in case you want to revert back to an older policy. Second is if there's any failures along the training process, you can always go back through that older policy. And um, so epoch zero typically just means the policy version zero. So let's look at this example. At the very beginning of the training, the policy doesn't know anything because it starts from square zero. Uh, so the car is within the track and it tells the policy, uh, this is the environment I'm observing. And because it's at the very beginning, the policy is not very smart. It just tells the car to take a random action. And in this case, it asks the car to take a right turn. And once that action is being taken, then from the environment, you can observe, okay, the car is now off the track. And that's not a desired behavior. And because of that, it's off the track. It actually gets a negative reward. And this episode is now terminated. So the policy knows when I observe that initial state, if I take a right turn, uh, I'm going to get a negative reward. That's not the right action to take. I should do something else. Then you try you're going back and you tried it again so in this case uh, after uh, you know a number of episodes of training the car finally tried the right action when 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 the car observed the initial state in this case it tries to drive forward then the result is that the car is now inside the track and as a result it gets a positive reward which enforces this right behavior and right action and once that's done now step two um, once the first step is you're still inside the track, now there's a new state of the world, the robot or the car is sending back to the policy. And because it's a new state, again, the policy now doesn't know what to do. So it takes another random action, and unfortunately in this case it takes a left turn, and as a result, now the car is off the track, and it's getting a negative reward. So that concludes this episode, and what happens next? You go back to square zero and you try it again. And in this case, it's tried again. And at step number two, the policy already knows when I took a left turn last time, I got a negative reward. So I want to use a different action through my action space. So it decides to make a right turn. And unfortunately, it still doesn't get to the desired outcome of staying inside the track. So again, uh, the policy gets a negative reward. Now, advance in step two left turn gets me a negative reward right turn gets me a negative reward so i'm going to try the last action in the action space which is keep straight and in this case it does keep the straight move forward um, its desired outcome the car is still inside the track and it gets a positive reward so through this very simple example you can see how reinforcement learning training works it basically does random trial at the very beginning of the policy training to try different actions inside the action space and then observe the outcome and get the right uh, reward, either positive or negative, to enforce the right behavior. Then after many, many uh, trial or episodes, eventually the policy learns how to take the right actions for every step and eventually maximize the reward and in turn uh, maximize the desired outcome in this case. So um, we kind of talked about that simple example and some of you might have already noticed well that sounds great but there are a few challenges or issues number one that was just a very simple example but even with that very simple example it sounds like you're gonna have to do a large number of trials like maybe a dozens dozens of times or maybe hundreds of times and if it's a much more complex problem with a lot more action space to explore or a lot more complex environment you're gonna do tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of trials it's very time-consuming how do you do that and number two 
every time as the car drives off the track, I need to go pick up the car, put it back to the original state, and do it again. It's again very time consuming, and if I want to make sure the car can drive on any arbitrary tracks, then I need to do that for a large number of different tracks of different shape and variations. It just sounds like not very practical to do that um, in the physical world. And that's absolutely right, and that's where there's this technology called a simulation that comes in play. Simulation is a piece of technology that allows you to mimic the behavior and outcome of the physical world in a 3D virtual world. So all that stuff is simulated in a 3D virtual environment running on a computer. Um, if you think about that concept, there are a few advantages and why simulation is so relevant and so critical as a piece of technology for reinforcement learning. Number one, you think about the reset behavior. After each of the episode trial, you want to revert everything, including the robot, including the environment, into the very beginning, the original state, where it's very hard to do in the physical world. It's very easy to do in a simulation. You can program that. You can reset the state of the entire world or the environment. Mm -hmm. And number two, because you want to make sure your policy or model can operate in very highly dynamic and varying environments, then during the training, you have to feed in a lot of dynamic environments to begin with. And again, it's very costly and to some extent impossible to do in the physical world, where in simulation, you can model these surrounding environments and object behaviors, and you can model hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands of them to train uh, the policy, so that once the policy is well-trained, you're confident that it, it, it is able to handle all these different kinds of dynamic and varying environments it's going to encounter in the real world. And not only that, a second advantage of simulation is timing. Um, so if you kind of do the math, to calculate how long does it take to do one set of episodes in the physical world, and how many episodes you can have to run in order to achieve the desired policy, some of the applications just impossible to do in the physical work because that's going to take hundreds of years to complete the training. In simulation, you can dramatically reduce the training time because of two uh, important factors of simulation. One, in simulation, you can run things in parallel. For example, in the car movement uh, example, you don't necessarily need to train the car to drive on a certain track then move on to the next track. In simulation, you can run parallel training so that the cars can get trained on different type of tracks concurrently and at the same time. Um, and second, um, in, tr in, in simulation, because the fact that it's all virtual, it can actually run faster than real time. So for example, if you run 2x of the real time speed in the simulation, that just means if you train the policy for an hour inside the simulation, that's the equivalent of two hours training time in the physical world. And because of that training speed, simulation provides for reinforcement learning. It becomes a critical piece of technology and a foundational piece of technology for reinforcement learning, learning applications in robotics. And at AWS, uh, we have a service called AWS RoboMaker uh, that is really uh, trying to provide the simulation capability to help customers with uh, any um, kind of robotics applications that might require simulation and reinforcement learning. It's just one of the examples, which is the, the focus of today's um, uh, presentation. So RoboMaker has a capability called Simulation Run. And it is a fully managed uh, simulation infrastructure for our customers to run large-scale and parallel simulations without the overhead of managing the infrastructure. Number one, it's highly scalable. You can run tens, hundreds, or even thousands of simulations in parallel, and sometimes through a single API call. And number two, it's fully managed. There's no server to provision, storage to provision, to manage or to scale. Everything is serverless, so you just provide your simulation application, and we will set up the infrastructure and run at scale. And lastly, which is very important, uh, it's very cost-effective. Uh, the pricing model, again, doesn't have any provisioning or pre-reserve or upfront payment in it. Uh, we measure the CPU memory 
uh, usage by the simulation workload and we only charge for the resource you use and the billing is based on the time you run your simulation at a minute granularity so you can do things like you know write 500 simulations and each running for 10 minutes and we only charge you for the 10 minutes for each of these 500 simulations based on their cpm memory usage once you're done with these uh, simulations you turn it off then you stop paying for uh, the simulation capability the other capability that I want to talk a little bit about is um, we have another simulation Woolforge capability inside RoboMaker. What it does is it can automatically generate 3D virtual environments for you to run simulation and do reinforcement learning training. So today we support generating indoor residential spaces. Um, there's no specialized skills required all the assets are provided out of the box you just go to the AWS RoboMaker console and make GUI based configurations then you can start generating a world or maybe tens of worlds or hundreds of worlds within minutes and what's nice about this capability is it's able to generate environments with variations for example if you want a three bedroom apartment it can generate three be three bedroom apartments varying in floor layout size the type of furniture you're putting the type of connections between different rooms and if you kind of recall for reinforcement learning uh, it gotta have to make sure the agent the policy eventually can work in highly dynamic environment in this case for example if i wanted to train a robot that's able to navigate in highly complex and varying home environments this is where uh, reinforcement learning plus Worldforce can come in and help because if you can train your reinforcement learning model in let's say hundreds or even thousands of varying virtual home environments inside the simulation you gain a lot of the confidence that when you deploy that robot in a real home no matter the type of setup or layout or furniture uh, the home has it's able to handle these different scenarios and, and dynamic environments so that's RoboMaker simulation. Then next, I want to kind of talk about uh, through a lens of an architecture perspective, how do you do reinforcement learning training on AWS? And again, it's through a very simple example. Um, the setup is you know, a little different from the car driving, so the track example. In this case, there are two robots in a, in a particular environment. And one of the robots is trying to find out where the other robot is and try to follow and approach that robot. Um, so um, in this case, the reward is based on the distance between these two robots. If they get the distance gets reduced after an action, uh, the following robot is taken, then you get a positive reward because you know that you're approaching that other robot that's being followed. And on the other hand, if the distance gets further away then it gets a negative reward so through that training the end result is a trained policy and along with an agent we can deploy onto the robot it'll be able to identify the other robot inside the environment and figure out a way to approach that robot and close the distance gap this is just kind of a quick video to show you how that works on the left hand side is kind of the camera view of the robot that's trying to find the other robot and trying to approach uh, that robot and on the right hand side you can see two robots and one of them is trying to approach uh, the other one and this is a result after hours of training inside global maker simulation and this is the um, architectural overview of the setup uh, we're leveraging a few AWS services for the setup on the left hand side inside the green box it's Amazon SageMaker uh, AWS's fully managed machine learning um, service and that's where the policy uh, lives and the model the policy gets trained. On the right hand side you see these um, red boxes that's RoboMaker simulation and you might have noticed it's not only one simulation job you can see multiple simulation jobs running concurrently and all these simulations are all, all trying to train the same uh, policy that stays in the um, Amazon SageMaker service. Then we're also using some of these other services for monitoring and policy checkpoint which we will talk a little bit about uh, in the next few slides so let's look at the top half like just want to talk a bit about uh, some of the key pieces of software service and um, and technology choices 
In this case, uh, the distributed training where you have a centralized policy lives in SageMaker and you have the multiple agents uh, controlling the robot running on multiple simulations to train the same policy in SageMaker. And that distributed training is, leveraged, um, is leveraging open source uh, reinforcement learning training framework called the Ray Library. It handles the policy server running SageMaker that talks to the policy client. And on each of the simulations, there's a policy client and establish communication for distributed training. Then inside each of the RoboMaker simulation job, there's a concept called an EPSO runner. It's really like the middleman uh, between the policy client and the agent. What it does is it takes the state information from the agent and pass the state uh, up to the policy. Then the policy makes decision on what action the agent should be taking. Then episode runner in turn takes that action from the policy and then uh, send that action as a command into the agent for taking the action in the environment. And roll-off fragments, it's really a fancy way of training, uh, of calling a training data. Uh, in our case, uh, the training data or rollout fragments includes the state, what am I seeing in the environment, the action, what, ac what action uh, the policy asked me to take, and the reward data, what's the outcome of the action, is it good, is it bad? And all of these training data or rollout fragments are generated from a parallel concurrently running simulations inside RoboMaker and all of these data are being fed into a single policy training mechanism inside the SageMaker to get the policy trained. And this is what I was referring to as parallel training. So you can see how you can speed things up because you have multiple simulations generating data concurrently to train the same policy in SageMaker. Then training metrics. So a lot of the time, these training happen in massive scale, and at the same time, they're all running headless mo uh, mode. So for example, you can say, run these trainings on 500 simulations for two hours. You, you're not necessarily looking at these 500 simulations as they're running. So monitoring a metric becomes critical. So in this case, we're collecting these metric data from SageMaker and pipe into a CloudWatch uh, for monitoring and visualization. So there are a few key metrics we can take a look at, like reward plot and how many episodes have been running. So it really gives the um, machine learning scientists the insight into uh, how the training is going. Then we also have something called a policy uh, checkpoint. We're leveraging S3, as I kind of mentioned. In reinforcement and training, there's a concept of an epoch. And each epoch typically maps the policy version. So what you can do here is, after you run a group of episodes, you feel like you've made a progress on the policy, you can save that policy version. Uh, so periodically, you can checkpoint that policy and save that policy into S3. And there are two reasons to do that. Number one is sometimes, as, as you keep going with the training, you might see a regression behavior. For example, an older policy actually gives me a high rewards versus the later on, uh, uh, a, a later on uh, policy. So you might have a reason to go back to an older policy, make some adjustments, and carry on with the training. And second reason is as you run our skill trainings, in case, there, in case there's any failures in the system, what you can do is you've saved the previous trained policy version so that it can always go grab an older version and then keep going on with the training. So it's really a best practice to do the checkpoint for your trained policies. This again is kind of the overview, the overall setup with all the area services and capability that we have today. You can run reinforcement learning training for robotics using simulation in RoboMaker and using SageMaker, using CloudWatch for monitoring and using S3 bucket for policy checkpoint. And at this ring, man, we have a new capability that just came out. Um, one of the SageMaker features is for those of you who are familiar with the Kubernetes toolchain, tool chain, now you can use Kubernetes to provision resource, orchestrate this training process, and manage the workflow. So there's a blog post talking about this new capability in SageMaker. Uh, so please go ahead and check it out if you're interested in that. And with that, uh, it concludes today's um, presentation. And I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, to today's session and here uh, you have my contact information so for those of you who are interested in the space of 
reinforcement learning or training for robotics applications, uh, feel free to reach out to me and I'd be happy to have a conversation and chat with you. And um, finally, uh, if you get a chance, uh, please help us fill the survey so that we can keep improving our sessions. And with that, I want to uh, you know, wish everyone to have um, a good day and enjoy the rest of the RingVent conference. Thank you.